I doubt foundation teachers are going to spend much time studying the curriculum because there's so little in there and they will be developing programs and using curriculum resources from other publishers. Foundation level teachers are the cream of the crop, they know what they're doing, they're doing a fantastic job of putting in place foundations. I just wish the curriculum writers had beefed this up more. Now the first thing to notice about the foundation level is that it has far less content than any of the other year levels. Um, if you look at this slide here, you can see that there are only 12 content descriptors, both in the old 2010 curriculum and in the proposed new one for 2022. Um, five of these are in the area of number, one in algebra, two each in measurement and space, and one each in probability and statistics. There's not a lot to say here, except that there isn't a lot of guidance for teachers. There are not very many curriculum content descriptors. Um, we have a new one on probability, which is a good thing. But seriously, I, uh, I doubt there's enough here for a good foundation level teacher to really get their teeth into and to develop a program that's really going to set in place the foundations that we need our students to have before they move on to year one and beyond. Now, if this review interests you and you want, wish to discuss it further and you want more detail, um, I've prepared a PDF file of each of the levels. Um, it's based on PowerPoint, so you can um, use it in a couple of different ways. What I will do in these videos is to look at each content descriptor in turn, have a brief check and see what's been left out in the new proposed curriculum, um, what's been added, and what's completely and what's been moved to a new position, a new new year level, and so on. Very few uh, content descriptors have actually moved, but a, there's a couple of key ones that will um, in, interest teachers. And I've noticed that in the media reports, the few that I've seen anyway, um, focus on those couple too. I'll give you a heads up. Spoiler alert: it's about telling time and fractions and number facts. So those three. Um, so the biggest change in the, the foundation level, it's not a really huge change, but the, the biggest change is a new content descriptor for probability. We haven't had one before, we'll come to that in a minute, and um, we'll have a quick look at that. The biggest gap in, in the, the way I'm formatting these, I'm trying to highlight the biggest changes and the biggest places where I think more content should be added. It's across the board. Um, in the foundation level, there is missing support for teachers to develop mathematical thinking. Um, we, can do, we can play a lot of games, we can have students do a lot of activities that are very nice, but are they really being challenged to think mathematically? And I have to say that it's in there, but it's sort of buried in the details. So it'll say something like subitizing, give you a little bit of explanation of what subitizing is, but not really delve into why we do subitizing the foundation, that it provides the student as they think about numbers and how it's developed further in later years and so on. It's, we'll do some subitizing. Okay, so we do subitizing. So we do a thousand worksheets a year and students do maths, but are they really learning to think mathematically? This is not an academic philosophical question. It's a pedagogical question. Are we teaching students to think mathematically? Should we be? Well, I think to me that's obvious. We are going to ask them to think mathematically in year one and year two and beyond, and it'll get increasingly more difficult, of course, naturally. But in foundation level, it feels like, well, we do a bit of this, a bit of that. There's 12 content descriptors for the entire year. 40 weeks of school content is boiled down to 12 statements of what students are learning. I just don't think there's enough. I think there's a lot more that could have been put into this document. My summary statement, if you're going to only watch the first part of this video, my opinion of this is that it's mathematics light with little to challenge students and teachers will need to create a wealth of worthwhile activities to avoid marking time while we wait for students to grow and mature. I have this feeling, it's just, a, just an impression I get that the curriculum writers for Foundation were thinking, well, they're very young, aren't they? And there's not a lot 
that they can do yet. They're still beginners in school. We'll just give them some foundational experiences. And in year one, we'll hit them with the really important stuff about place value and number and number facts and all that sort of thing. But in, in foundation or prep as it is in Queensland and other names are given in other states, it feels like the writers of the curriculum didn't actually want to put too much in there. They didn't want to overwhelm anybody, the teachers or the students, which I think is an insult to the teachers. I mean, my other overall statement here will be, I doubt foundation teachers are going to spend much time studying the curriculum because there's so little in there and they will be developing programs and using curriculum resources from other publishers and you know they will do a good job. They're professionals. They know what they're doing. They Obviously, everybody understands maths at a different level, but foundation level teachers are the cream of the crop. They know what they're doing. They're doing a fantastic job of putting in place foundations. I just wish the curriculum writers had beefed this up more. The same criticisms uh, can be leveled, of course, at the 2010 curriculum because that only had 12 curriculum uh, content descriptors. And you can see where the gaps are. There's nothing on fractions and decimals. Well, perhaps we wouldn't. There's nothing on money. There's nothing on chance. And there's a smattering of others. But again, there's only 12 content descriptors in total. Well, let's move on. So we're going to look at how content descriptors are identified. Uh, you can see there's a, a, it's almost like a secret code, but I think I've cracked it. On the left-hand side, the existing curriculum that we're all familiar with starts with ACM, Australian Curriculum Mathematics. Then NA is the designator for number and algebra. And then there's the three-digit number. Those three-digit numbers increment gradually through all the content descriptors across all the, across all the strands. I'm pleased to see how they've uh, coded the new one. The cons consultation curriculum, I'm calling it 2021, for 2022, it's consultation. It's not set in stone yet, thank goodness. Um, this is what we've got, AC9M, Australian curriculum number 9M. Why number nine, I don't know. We haven't seen numbers one to eight so far. Somebody decided it needed a nine. I'm guessing that it's the ninth iteration of the curriculum, but maybe it is, maybe it isn't. F for foundation, that's good. So now you can see when you see a code, if it has an F in there, it's for foundation. Not bad. N is for number, so we're separating number from algebra. And then what I really like is the code numbers on the end is a two-digit number. In this case, the example is 01. Those increment within the strand. So this is number, strand, content descriptor 01. After that will be N02, then N03, and so on. So you can see where you're up to within the strand, which I think is a great idea. Let's move on. <clears throat> so the first curriculum descriptor in the old curriculum, connect number names, numerals, and quantities, including zero initially up to 10 and then beyond. In the new curriculum, we've got connect numbers including zero to their representative quantities, numerals, number names, and position in the sequence initially up to 10 and then beyond. It's almost identical. Now, I'll just explain the coloring here. I, you'll see these content descriptors have orange text on the left-hand side in places. That's where we can't find the content from the old curriculum included in the new one. For so, so someone has decided to eliminate that. If it's been completely removed, uh, you'll see there's a cross, um, the, the text is crossed through. If it's simply, it hasn't been mentioned, but you could say it's implied, then we'll leave it as orange. The blue text represents new content that wasn't there the first time. Again, some of these are just natural additions that if you rearrange the wording and change the sentence, then you'll need some more words and so, but, but by and large, this is new content in the consultation curriculum. And that is one of the things that really has improved this time around. So in the consultation curriculum, the only change here is 
and position in the sequence. So we're looking at numbers generally, number names, numerals and quantities, including zero, firstly up to 10, then beyond. That's all covered, but we look at their position in the sequence. Minor change, something the teachers would do already. Um, I don't think it needs a great deal of comment. Let's move on, number two. You'll see the code on the right hand side is AC9MFN02. So once again, this is the second content descriptor in the number strand. The old descriptor from the 2010 curriculum is remarkably short, sabotage small collections of objects. And I like that. I mean, it needs a whole lot of unpacking. What do you mean by sabotage and what are the limits on it? But it's quite a good one. Now they've decided that teachers didn't know what sabotage meant. That's me reading between the lines. So they're saying instantly recognize and name the number of objects within collections up to five items without counting brackets sabotage. The only issue I've got with this is why pick five? Who says you can only sabotage up to five? Now there's research on this. It's interesting little piece of research, which is how much, uh, what size of a group can a child or an adult, for that matter, recognize without counting the individual objects? And the answer is about five. However, if you structure the arrangement of objects, for example, to use my favorite resource for maths of all time, 10 frames, you can sabotage up to 10 like that. You can see if there are seven in a 10 frame, whichever way you do it, whether you do it in pairs with one extra one, or you fill up five and then two more, you don't have to count them. You can see it's seven. You can see there are three left. You can count beyond 10. If you have double 10 frames, you could easily count up to, you, sorry, you could sabotage easily well beyond 10, right up to 20. You could sabotage 18. It wouldn't be difficult. There'd be two blank ones, two full 10 frames. There's 18. So it's a shame that the Curriculum writers have decided that sabotaging really only goes to five. It's an incredibly useful skill for students to develop and it should have been expanded. For my mind, you could just eliminate the part that says of up to five items without counting, just get rid of that and mention something about the structure of a physical representation of number and how that can help sabotage them. I mean, if you're going to expand on it, that's where the way I would do it. Quantify and compare collections of at least 10 objects by recognizing and naming partitions. That's all very useful. To be honest, I don't know why this says at least 10 children should be looking at part, part, whole relationships of smaller numbers like eight. How else can we divide eight? Well, we could divide it into four plus four. There's a nice partition, very, very useful partition. Two lines of four or two square blocks of four. Uh, we could partition it into seven and one. That's important. Um, eight is the next number after seven. So I think it's a shame I, if, if I'm making recommendations and I will be putting in a written submission in the hope that curriculum writers actually read what I say, to say, get rid of this at least 10 rubbish and just say partition numbers. I mean, you could partition two if you wanted to. No one's going to really spend very long on it. But you could say two is double one. It's one and one. It's the next number after one. It's one less than three. We can partition very small quantities. So I think that is a mistake. Moving along, we have establishing understanding of the language and processes of counting by naming numbers in sequences, initially to and from 20, moving from any starting point. And then a second content descriptor, which is bundled together in the new one, compare order and make correspondences between collections initially to 20 and explain reasoning. The new one is a little more concise, establish understanding of the language and processes of counting to quantify, compare, order, make correspondences. Now, since that's all in black, we can see that it's all the same. It's the same content that was in the previous one. The only thing is um, we've left out the part about by naming numbers in sequences. And we've left out the part moving from any starting point. I don't understand why that is. Children should be able to count from any starting point. You should be able to start from six and say what comes after six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's an important skill. Otherwise, if we always start from one, 
we'll have students who can rote recall the names of numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but they won't be able to start in the middle. It's far more useful to be able to say, okay, we're starting from nine, what's the next number? 10, and then what comes after that, 11 and 12, rather than say, here's nine, what's nine plus two more? And we go all the way back to one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So I think they should put that part in, back in, about moving to any starting point. Now we have uh, two content descriptors, numbers four and five. They're being combined together simply because the old content descriptor, for some unknown reason, bundled together addition and sharing. It didn't even call it division. Now, sharing is a useful understanding of numbers that children will have, but it doesn't really belong with addition. The, the inverse relation, of course, is subtraction, and so they should have said whatever. And there was no reason why subtraction should be left out of the old one. Even at foundation level, children can play with toy objects, cars and dolls and things, and, and count up how many there are here and how many there are there, and make stories about more being added and about things being subtracted and yet they left subtraction out. So in the new one, we have a lot of blue text, which means there's masses of more detail that's been added. Model, I'm glad it says model. Represent is good, but model is probably a better word. Model practical situations and solve problems. That's all new, it doesn't say about solving problems in the old one. If you knew what you were doing with the old content descriptor, you would have included problem solving and modeling and so on. but this really expands it and adds more detail. Involving addition and subtraction, ray, ray for subtraction, with physical and virtual materials, using counting or sabotizing strategies to determine the total or the number of objects remaining. So it's really spelling it out. Here we have a situation where children are gonna make up stories, they're gonna use objects, they're gonna model things, they're gonna use some sabotizing, and they can use physical or virtual materials, so physical objects, pictures of objects, objects on a, on a screen of some description. And then we add to it sharing, model practical situations and solve problems that involve equal sharing through role play and games using physical and virtual materials. It's interesting from a, uh, from a mathematical standpoint that we include sharing but not multiplication. So we've got three of the four operations here, addition and subtraction and sharing. That I think is appropriate. Multiplication is a much more difficult operation to handle. Sharing on the other hand is okay. Sharing is good for everyday stories. Uh, children experience sharing a lot in everyday life. In the average family, there'll be lots and lots and lots of sharing going on. Um, so I don't have a problem with that. Um, and. I've bundled these together on the same screen simply because they came from the, the same old content descriptor, but they stand alone um, as two new ones. Let's move on to algebra. The content descriptor identifiers now have an A code where the N, N was before, foundation level, algebra strand, starting with zero, 01. So we don't continue from the numbers that we got to last time, we start again with 0, 1 for algebra. And here we have sort and classify familiar objects and explain the basis for these classifications being completely eliminated. So classifying and sorting, we're not interested anymore. Why? I don't know. You could have separated it, curriculum writers. You could have said, we've got patterning, which is the second part, copy, continue, and create patterns with objects and drawings and just have that as a standalone and have categorizing and sorting and um, it's an important skill. How do you count a collection of disparate objects? Well, lots of situations lend themselves to categorizing and sorting. So we'll say, let's put all the left-handed doodads over there and the right-handed doodads over there and it will put the red ones there and the blue ones there and we sort them and classify them and then we count them and organize them. It's an incredibly useful skill. It's something that little children can do. Foundation level is ideal for it. I just don't know why it got left out. I would add another foundation level content descriptor myself. 
So we have describe, which is an important part of it. Copy, continue and create, that's good. Repeating patterns, that emphasizes the fact that patterns are repeating using different elements. And this part I love. In the old one, it just mentioned objects and drawings. The new one says movement, sounds, colors, objects, shapes, and numbers. Fantastic. Gives foundation teachers lots more play, uh, lots more ideas that you can come up with. I would have loved as a young child being asked to make patterns using sounds. So you could do clap, clap, bit of old coin there, but um, we can have students invent patterns in interesting ways. It has a nice link with music. Music is full of patterns. Fantastic. Love it. Let's move on. That's the only one we've got for algebra. Now we're moving straight on to uh, measurement. The old curriculum code included measurement and geometry, the MG code. The new one has just M for measurement, which is good. Here we have two content descriptors from the old curriculum being combined into one. We have comparisons used direct and used to say and indirect comparisons to decide which is longer, heavier or holds more and explain reasoning. <clears throat> and then combine and order duration of events using everyday language. Okay, so we've combined the whole lot together, which means we're having measurement using the attributes of length, capacity, mass, and duration, which is the same that was in the old one, but they're, they're combining the two, as I said before. Explore and identify attributes of objects and events. That's good. There's a lot more unpacking to do. There are lots of useful verbs that we can use. Use direct comparisons. For some reason, indirect comparisons are left out. I don't know why curriculum writers do this. They say, well, we don't need indirect. Who says we don't need indirect comparisons? We can do it. My view is that one of the first questions to ask in, in terms of where the content should be in a particular curriculum is to, find, to decide whether children that age can do it or not. Can children of a young age, the foundation level students, can they make indirect comparisons? And I would argue, yes, of course they can. It's pretty obvious. Give them a piece of string and say, right, we're going to make, see how long this is and see how long that is. And we'll take this piece of string over there. It's a really useful learning activity. I would put it back in there. Anyway, I didn't write it. Compare pairs of objects and events using these attributes and communicating reasoning. I like the language. I like the, the, the number of verbs that are there, the number of different activities that are included. I just put the indirect part back in. Foundation measurement content description number two. In the old one, we have connect days of the week to familiar events and actions. That's all in black, which means we're keeping, we're retaining all of the content. The new one says connect days of the week and times of day, morning, lunchtime, afternoon, evening, to familiar events and actions. It's almost identical. I like the addition. Again, this is useful content to add morning, lunchtime, afternoon, evening. Keep it. Don't change that, please. Let's move on. We're getting towards the end now. Uh, space. This is a new name for Australian. It used to be part of geometry. Um, now there's one called space, which I think is quite nice. We have two content descriptors in this one. This one is about looking at the attributes of objects. Sorting, naming, make familiar shapes and objects, recognize and describe familiar shapes and objects within the environment using everyday language. So it's recognizing geometrical entities in the natural environment. What's been left out now, and I've got some thoughts on this one, the only thing that's left out is calling shapes two-dimensional shapes and calling objects three-dimensional objects. Now, I thought that was useful. I found in trying to describe entities that are flat quite tricky. You can call them figures. You can call them diagrams, pictures, shapes. Are they shapes? Yes, they're shapes. There are other more technical words we can use like polygons and so on. But calling them two-dimensional was useful. And objects, we've got to, we have to be able to separate things that have three dimensions. They have some um, 
it's effectively that they have some physical existence. A two-dimensional object has no physical existence because it's like it's infinitely thin. So you have a square. A square doesn't exist in a physical form. It's, it's a shape. It's a two-dimensional shape. I think calling them two-dimensional shapes and three-dimensional objects is useful. The curriculum writers, in their greater wisdom than mine, have decided we don't need to call them two-dimensional and three-dimensional. I think that's a shame. I think it's a, um, a mistake to do that. And I think teachers would benefit from being reminded that all shapes are two-dimensional and all objects are three-dimensional. It's, it's a fine point, perhaps, and maybe someone thought there were too many words on the page, but... Seriously, I don't think you're helping teachers by removing those um, descriptors. So we're looking at shapes and the environment, and I think that's useful. The second one, we had describe position and movement in the old curriculum. The new one says describe position and movement. Good. And then we add more detail of self and objects in relation to other objects and locations with the familiar space. Useful or good. Move on to prob probability. There was no content descriptor for probability in the old curriculum, so that's why that part is blank. It's the only place where it is. And here we have a completely brand new content description. Discuss and explore the outcomes of games and familiar events involving chance. Fantastic. Glad to see it's in there. Teachers will be able to come up with lots of really good activities the children will enjoy. It'll be playing games. They'll have fun. And you get to talk about things like dice. When we roll the dice, what number's going to come up? Are any of the numbers more likely to come up than the others? Is it more difficult to roll a six? You know, if we toss a coin, why do we toss a coin? We toss a coin to make a decision when we don't know. It, you know, we're trying to randomize the decision. We're going to have to explore those concepts with students. I think they'll have a lot of fun. It opens up lots of opportunities for teachers to make fun activities. Okay, so now we're going to look at the very last content descriptor. This is in the strand for statistics using the code ST. And there's just the one for prep uh, foundation level. Sorry, keep calling it prep. You'll see that in the old content descriptor, it refers to answering yes and no questions. That has been completely left out. I thought it was fairly limiting to say only those sorts of questions were um, were um, appropriate um, avenues of study. So I'm quite happy with that. You can see that the description on the right-hand side in the consultation curriculum is quite a bit more detailed. I think that's a good thing. And by and large, um, in fact, I think in all the statistics content descriptors, they have been expanded explanations of what it is that's intended and I think in the main that is a very good thing. Um, the impression I've got is that someone was tasked to go ahead and revise the statistics content descriptors in particular and they've really expanded them. They're probably twice as long as they used to be so I think that's uh, very helpful. So that's it for now. We've looked at the foundation level of the consultant consultation curriculum and reviewed each of the content descriptions. There's more to be said on this. Um, there will be other videos that I'm going to do looking at benchmarking, for example, against other countries' curriculums. But for now, this um, is fairly quick but comprehensive look at the content descriptors at the foundation level. I hope you find it useful. I'm formatting these so that they would be useful in a school if you wanted to use them that way. I think this would be very valuable for a school staff, for example, to discuss in more detail the curriculum recommendations, the proposed changes to the curriculum. I'll point out this, and this is very important, um, I believe. If I can get the, there it is, the page to open. ACARA, the body that's responsible for producing curriculums in Australia, has asked for public feedback. The feedback period goes from the 29th of April, which is nearly a month ago, until the 8th of July 2021. So it doesn't leave a whole lot of time. And the CEO of ACARA has stated, we want teachers, principals, education specialists, 
parents and the wider community to let us know what they think of the proposed revisions. I'm pleased they're doing that. I think we should take them at their word and give them some feedback, give them some um, responses. If we don't say anything, we can expect the curriculum to be pretty much as it is written. And as I've indicated, I think there are a number of areas where this could be improved. One of which would be to put back in the language they've cut out in many, many places. Um, but there are fine tweaks. There are structural things that we might like to comment on. I encourage you to contribute to that. If you've enjoyed this video, please hit the like and subscribe button and leave a comment below if you've got any thoughts at all about the curriculum at the foundation level and what should and should not be in it please speak up please have your say below this video um, if you'd like copies of the documents that i've mentioned that are relevant to this discussion i'm going to put links to all of them underneath and i hope you'll come back and watch other videos as they are prepared that's it for now thank you for watching i'll talk to you next time